You are definitely the most stylish player in the history of the NBA. I stuck in that emotion. Yeah, I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. Bounding and astounding. Stumbling and bumbling. <laughs> wheeling and dealing. <laughs> I've said these things hundreds of times in my living room. That's why the spontaneity comes out. Agile and hostile now. How was your basketball game as a youngster? The older guys would put me in to shoot because I was a good shooter. Major with a nice shot. Then they go, you better not lose them or kick your butt. <laughs> so that's how I learned how to pressure. shoot on the pressure. <laughs> so first of all, let me explain this hat. Because it is an honor to you. I'm wearing it because of you. Because you were one of my favorite athletes ever growing up. I wanted to be like you. I wanted to have the same temperament that you had. It was all about excellence. I couldn't wear the clothes like you wore them because I didn't have no money at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but you've always been that person and done it so well. So well. And thanks for being with me. We're going to have a good Thank time you, just Laura, kicking it. it around, man. So the first thing, your vocabulary and the way you do the work in sports is just unbelievable. The moment I think that you don't have any more, here come seven more of them. <laughs> Isolating, devastating now. Dramatic, emphatic play started by Oach. You have agile and hostile. And whatever it is, that's exactly what I just saw. Agile and hostile. And there's nothing quite like you in the broadcasting business. There has never been. There's nobody going to ever be. Styling and profiling with the stuff. Once you get in the business, they say you got to get your own style. Yes. You know, so you try to create that. But what I used to do, when, my, when, when I'm watching a game, I turn the sound off. When no one is talking to you, you have to be more attentive. Right, right. So then that's where I come up. I've said these things hundreds of times in my living room. Bounding and astounding. You know, stumbling and bumbling, <laughs> wheeling and dealing. <laughs> so that's why the spontaneity comes out. Winning and grinning tonight. Oh, how about the feline quickness canine attitude? See, I feel you <laughs> like that one. <laughs> I improved my vocabulary by the New York Times, the arts and leisure section, when they critique the plays, riveting, mesmerizing, provocative, profound. Right. So I started writing down all those words. That's an entrancing, that's how. So entertaining. It's as entertaining as the game itself. That's why you take a game that you're doing, it goes from just a regular game to here. And the good dishing and swishing by the Knicks. First time they interviewed me, I was, I was nervous, and that's not my forte. I, I usually like to be funny and loose, mm -hmm. but I thought they would ask me something and I would be saying, you know, and you know, couldn't get out of it. Right. So I knew right away, I go, man, you gotta improve your vocabulary. Gymnastic <laughs> acrobatics by Brunson. Whenever I went on the road, I grabbed a couple of books. And I just studied the words, studied the words. And it's one of those things, if you're ever watching a Nick game, don't turn that sound down. Turn that sound up. <laughs> That's the key. Turn that sound up. If Clyde's doing the game, turn that thing up, because you'll get entertained. You know, in the beginning, I was criticized for it. People were saying, why? What is he using that for? Why is he doing that? But I was like, hey, man, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. When you're on the air, it's like when you're playing, you're reacting. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what words I'm coming out with. It just comes out. Wheeling and dealing and thrilling. See, and I try to do the game like I want for me. I tell you how tall these guys are some idiosyncrasies that they might have. Right. So when I'm watching the game, that's what I, like I hate that they never tell you the temperature of the football game. Right. But then they have some places where, I think somebody told me in Boston you had cold water in the shower. And they use that as a home court advantage. And the night before, when you get there, they send off a fire alarm <laughs> at three or four purpose. in the morning. Yeah. They had all these oh tricks, my all gosh. the tricks. But it backfired on them in 1973. Stolen by Frazier, he drives out the lane, lays it up. That it maybe was right there. Yeah, right, well, right, they right. pushed the wrong button. <laughs> 1973, <laughs> right. We got him for that. <laughs> so where, where this is Jacob's restaurant? Tell me about this place. Jacob's uh, is in Harlem. I, I moved here, I was just telling you, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I used to come in the place, and one day he approached me and said, man, you, you're so nice to the customers and everything. We became friends, and it is and, wonderful. Uh, I have never seen soul food laid out like this. Don't befriend him, Mark. <laughs> That's not the right you have to have thing. a lot of discipline with Jay Jacob, man. You know, on Thanksgiving, he feasts the whole neighborhood. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. He's been doing that for 10 years that I've been coming. Sometimes I come in and help serve. People what a surprise funny. that would be. Yeah, yeah, you know, they come in and they go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look like Walt Frazier, man. You look like Walt Frazier, yeah. So tell me about you. 
Where'd the Walt Frazier story begin? Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in humble beginnings. I'm the oldest of nine kids. Oh my gosh. Growing up in that scenario, like you said, a lot of babysitting. And then I had to know how to iron. And my sartorial splendor, I ironed my own shirts and do my own thing. You are probably one of the coolest people that I've ever met. And I mean that in just the way that you handle yourself, the way you go about things. You were the person that I was always looking at. You were the smoothest guy on there. I loved the way you played. I tried to play like that myself. I never spent any energy on dancing in the end zone or throwing the ball down the end zone. This is extra energy. But that was just me and my sort of personality. And when I read things about you, you were doing some of the same things that way also. Where did that confidence come from? From being the oldest, yeah. I was a role model before I knew what the word meant. Mm -hmm. When my parents weren't around, I was in charge. I had to take my sisters to school, I had to do this. So then when I got into sports, I was always the captain of the football team, basketball, baseball. That's how I became uh, handling the cool because everyone was depending on me. So inside, I'm percolating like everybody else. Right. But outwardly, I have this cool demeanor. I played 12 years in the NBA. I never had a technical foul call. It's unbelievable. But that is, that's where the confidence comes in. One time I was all over Elgin Baylor. I was trying to, you know, he was like I wasn't even there, man. <laughs> right, <laughs> it was like, right. I, so that's how I developed that poker face. Yes. When guys are harassing me, they don't know if they're getting through or not. Right. I don't show any emotion. I just keep my cool what I'm doing. Because people can't read your reflection. Were you a better football player than you were a basketball player at that time? Because you were a quarterback. I thought so. I was an excellent passer. Johnny United was my was my idol. Yeah. So I could throw like 50, 60 yards. Yeah. Growing up in the South, football is king. Yeah. You know, my mom never came to a basketball <laughs> game. <laughs> <laughs> How was your basketball game as a as a youngster? Was I was a, like a precocious neophyte. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. I was like two blocks from the playground, so played on dirt. The older guys would put me in to shoot because I was a good shooter. You know, like they would shoot for nickels or dimes and they go, you better not lose them or kick your butt. <laughs> so that's how I learned how to pressure. shoot under pressure. <laughs> under pressure. <laughs> right. So they would put me in, I'd be shooting. In Atlanta, they named the basketball court in your honor. How, how did you feel about that? Was that like one of the biggest highlights in your, in your life? Yeah, yeah, because it was only a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it was just overwhelming, but a magnificent feeling for me to have that honor. You know, Dr. King also attended my school. Oh, the same school? Yeah. Wow. When you come up like that, you end up being a type of person that when you move up, you reach back and bring somebody else up with you. Right. You know? It's Sharing and caring. Yes. So yes. I always say, yes, and you've know, always been that person. You know, I always talk about the village. Like, we had a foundation. My foundation was on family, education. My mother, is, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice, Walt. And my grandfather and father who grew up under the impression of segregation never looked down on a man unless you're helping him get up. All these people, I'm standing on their shoulders right now as a successful person, wearing these rings, right. all of that. Yeah, without that, I, I would not be here, of course. Well, that's, that, that's absolutely great. Tell me about when you first got to New York. What was that like, coming from Atlanta to New York? Well, my first foray was the NIT. Which you guys won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and catapulted me into the national limelight because I was the MVP mm -hmm. of the NIT. And then all of a sudden, they were saying, well, this guy, Frazier, go pro. So I was reading that, man. I, I still didn't believe it. I didn't have the confidence that I would. I can't imagine you not having confidence. Because every time I've ever seen you, any of you have done, the first thing I think of is what a confident person you are. Yeah. I think it was a scenario where I thought it was too good to be true. Uh -huh. Like the first time I got on a plane, I'm going, it's got to go down. <laughs> <laughs> like this can't be, <laughs> something has to happen to me. When we talk about New York and athletes coming to New York, you can either soar under this kind of microscope or you can get run out of town. To me, you were the epitome of New York, and but I never, I've never seen you play hesitant. I've never <laughs> seen, I've never seen you play where you weren't in control of what was going on all around you. Yeah, I love pressure. I, I grew up like it. I always liked pressure. Like when I played on the playground, I got the worst guys on my team. Yeah. I never picked the best guys. Right, right. Yeah. So I like to try to 
to win, you know, we're not the best team. Like when I came into the NBA, I would have hated it if the Celtics drafted me. Right. Because they always won. Right, right. You know, I don't want to be with a team that always won. But tell me about how great it was playing in front of the most knowledgeable <laughs> basketball fans in the world. You know, what was that like? It's not only a blessing, but an honor. Mm -hmm. Stolen by Frazier. Out of the backcourt. Down the lane with the photo, but it's good! In the playoffs, I couldn't even walk the streets. I couldn't get where I was going. You know, people were stopping. People you don't think even know anything about basketball would be asking about, right. yo, what are you going to do with the pearl tonight? Yeah, you know, right. How are you going to stop the pearl tonight? <laughs> So it, it was so, so encompassing the city into Tuesday and Saturday night, everything stopped in New York right. for three hours to watch the Knicks. You are the New York Knicks. And I think when people think of you, they think of the championships. They also think of the way you fought like a New Yorker. This is all about your upbringing. Man. Yes, it is. When you're thrust into that, how are you going to handle it? Like when you're playing for these championships, right? It's the culmination of all your experience as a kid, coaches, everybody that gets you psyched up. Yes. When you get these, you you are idol forever. You're right. An icon. I go to restaurants now. I don't have to pay somebody to buy my drink. I get in a taxi. Guy Clyde, you can't pay. After 50 years of my life, <laughs> it's, it's like still. amazing. Yeah. Frazier, number 10. The other thing it was in the 70s it was a time, a very tumultuous time. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, yep. segregation, racism. So for three hours, they could go watch some black and white guys playing as one. Right. The ball moving around yes. freely, hit the open man, helping out. Yeah, yeah. That kind of camaraderie and teamwork mm -hmm. just captivated the city. The crossover, they talked about crossover where, you know, white kids wanted to be like Clyde or Willis. You right. Know, and the parents are saying that, man. <laughs> yes. The kind of respect for the guys that we had. There's something about the Knicks and, and the personalities on that team that people still relish. At one point, you called yourself the best guard in the NBA and even predicted an MVP in an All-Star game, which you did both. Where's that confidence coming from? You know, I actually gained it from once I got to the pros, being in New York, every year in the confidence crew because I was going up against these guys and I was competing against them. Right. You know, and I was winning. Right. So that's the most important thing about the confidence, you gotta win. Early on, I was trying to be like Big O and Jerry West. Mm -hmm. These were the premier guys. So once they started aging, I was like, man, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a star. And I was saying to myself, I can't let anybody take this from me. Bill Bradley said that Frazier is the only player who takes an artistic approach to the game. More ballet than bronze. Right, because of my steals, how I would set guys up. Sometimes during the game I could steal the ball, but it wouldn't mean anything. Right. But when it's a key moment and you do it, you can change the momentum of the game. The pro course was so soft because they picked them up and put them down. Right, so right, right. They had a lot of dead spots. So I knew where all the dead spots were. If you, if I'm guarding you, yeah. I know you go over there, the ball is not coming up. <laughs> right, right. All right, so that's how I made a lot of my steals. <laughs> but you just went about your business so professionally and so beautiful, nobody, like nobody I've ever seen. You were the orchestrator of the game. Well, my whole game was the, uh, the sagacity. You see, if I'm on offense, I can see your feet. Yeah. If they're parallel, I know I can go around you. You gotta have a staggered stance. Butt down, head up. Right. My teammates had the utmost respect for me. Right. They wanted me to have the ball. Right, Clyde, you see the ball. And yeah. if they knew they were gonna be open, they knew you were gonna find them. Right. I was gonna pass the ball, give it up. It was a lot, a lot like Brunson right now. Yes. You know, he's he not concerned with scoring. As far as not being a team player, yes. not worried about scoring. Yes. But doing what he has to do to win. Mm hmm And and it's savvy that he plays with. And he brings it every night. Every night. That's what you have to do to be a superstar, to be consistent. That's why he's a maestro, folks, a virtuoso. I can safely say of all my playing and, and being involved in athletics that you are definitely the most stylish player in the history of the NBA. I second that emotion. Yeah, I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that because it was real. <laughs> you know how that started? Mm -mm. Growing up as a kid, I miss segregation. Whenever you go downtown, you got to put on your Sunday best. 
and your best manners. Mm -hmm. Mother said, you know, you're not only representing the Frazier family, but black people as well. well. Even now, when I do that, when I step out to the Nick games, right. that's what I am. I, you know, that's how, how it all started. Walt Clyde Frazier. One day we were in Baltimore, and I see this wide brim hat. A Vaseline, a brown velour hat. So I buy this hat. First time I wear it, everybody laughed at me. But being confident, like you alluded to, I go, man, I look good in this hat. I'm gonna keep it on. As fate would have it, two weeks later, the movie, Bonnie and Clyde comes out. So then I walk into the locker room, everybody go, hey, look at Clyde. <laughs> right. So that's how I got the name Clyde for wearing the hat. It's the best nickname, fits better than any nickname that you've ever heard in any sport. It is, and I'm sure there's a lot of people go, they, don't, they forgot that your name was Walt. Yeah, you know, in New York, right? Well, yeah. if you call me Walt, I know you know, you know from me. college right, or right, where right. I grew up. Right. Here's something that you said. This is a quote of yours that I, I love this quote. Have pride in the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you carry yourself. Discipline is a thing that makes you a champion. That's a wonderful statement. That was my philosophy. And the other thing was Shakespeare. All the world's a stage, man. When I go to the games, I go, they're just waiting on you, Clyde. All the world's a stage. I might be crazy to say this, but in many ways, you're as beloved as a broadcaster as you were as a player. Yeah, it's a real blessing, Mike. Tenacious work ethic. It's ingrained in you. Yeah. Because growing up under the segregation, we knew that 99 and a half won't do. Right. You ain't getting that job. Right. You got to give 110 percent to get that job, man. Wasn't that twice <laughs> as good to get half as much? That's right. You got to work, man. So I have, I'm still working. Right. Still have a tenacious whatever I do. That's how I attack broadcasters. Mm -hmm. It is just absolutely wonderful to be able to sit down and kick this thing around with you. You are the greatest Nick ever, in my okay. opinion. There's nobody been better and that has come through it like you have and still here. And there's probably a bunch of young African Americans that are watching and trying to walk in that same footstep, which is a wonderful thing to do. When people come up and say, hey, Clyde, I used to go to your camp, man. You did this, Clyde, I did that. You know, nothing's better than that. Once a Nick, always a Nick. Exactly. So one of the really great things is coming up here doing this with you today is I got to find out about Jacob's Restaurant. I'll be back here because Don't this... come back, Ahmad. I'm warning you. <laughs> Don't come to. back. I have to come back. <laughs> I'm going to come across the street and bring you back over here with me. You're going to get hooked. You're sure. going to get hooked. Should I wear my hat? That style and the profile in there. <laughs> <laughs> man, thank you, man. Hello. I really appreciate the time, man. I really appreciate it. I was so excited about this when we started talking about it.